here. I see you now. I don't see your sidebar video, though. Are you? I haven't turned on video. I, 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 I've I shown the agenda. Yeah. Hang on, let me. Yeah, so I'm not sure my screen. And for Sorry. some reason, my. Why is my Adium disconnected? There you go. Hi, everybody. <laughs> this is how I intended to be able to keep track of chat and the queue at the same time. And my Jabber is not connected separately. Oh, there it is. Now it is. All right. Well, we're fairly tight for time, Dave. So if you're ready, I think we should. Uh, yeah, I'm good. Okay. Uh, hey, everybody. Welcome to ADD and ITF 108. Uh, our, our second virtual session. Um, I, I don't think we, I, I don't have a whole lot to say other than I want to bring attention to uh, we have a doodle poll for a September interim. Uh, this in planning this session here, we had a lot of requests for speaking time, which we could not accommodate everyone on. And as it is, we had to cut everybody down to roughly about ten minutes, uh, including questions. So it's going to be very tight today. Uh, there is a link there in the minutes, uh, as well as if you go over to the the, um, the Etherpad or the the, the COVID mid and look there. I posted the actual link there, uh, so you can go out and fill in the doodle poll. We're looking for probably like the, the week somewhere between just after Labor Day, the end of that week, and then the beginning of the following week. That seemed to avoid most national holidays and other things that were going to be going on uh, during the month of September. So go fill that dual poll. We've had good, good participation so far, and get your voice heard. Dave, that's all I had to say. Anything you wanted to add? Uh, uh, three things, I guess, already based on what just came up in chat that I was starting to type in response to. Uh, Jim Reed, and just in case you're kidding, Labor Day is a holiday in the United States that occurs the first Monday in September. Um, so we're talking about mid-September there. The uh, Martin, we actually did deny a couple of people being able to speak. Uh, part of the problem here was, and I will take some responsibility, at the time we needed to decide on how long a meeting slot we needed. I um, made um, the observation that traffic on the list was pretty light at the time. We didn't seem to have too many burning issues. And then we made our choice and a, a week later, we clearly needed more time. So I apologize for suggesting we did not need the maximum length slot. Um, then, but. Off to the interim. What we can't cover today, we will make sure to get to in the interim. Uh, thanks, Dave. And and by the way, good good activity on the list. It was quiet, as you say, and uh, we've had a I, I would say in the last few days some pretty good technical discussion. So and some good draft reviews. So I think we're making uh, pretty good progress. Okay. So um, agenda bash. Uh, we we have what we have. Uh, we have uh, eight uh, speakers today. And very tight on time, and Daniel needs to go off to his group. So why don't we jump right into um, Daniel? If somebody has a, a, a pressing agenda modification they'd like to bring up right now, okay. Let's jump to Daniel's slides. Hey, Daniel, just let me know when you want me to jump to the next slide, and you're on. Yeah. So thank you. So. Um, next slide. So I'm going to present uh, the DNS Resolver Discovery Protocol, the RDP, which is um, uh, which, which aims to address the two main two areas of the charter. That is defining mechanisms that allow a client to discover DNS Resolver that support encryption. Those resolver could be private as well as public, and communicate DNS Resolver information so that a selection can occur. Um, to reflect the end user or application policy, um, all this information needs to come from multiple resolvers. Up, the information must be up to date and uh, certified. Um, otherwise, the, the selection is uh, hard to be um, um, trusted or um, enabled. Next slide. So today, the client begins with the knowledge of uh, a DNS resolver IP, and um, auto upgrade is uh, being performed through a large list of IP addresses. And um, we believe it should be—it's not a 
um, the right way we do because it's not scalable. It's hard to maintain uh, uh, such a huge list. Uh, most of the information into that list is not relevant to the user. Uh, for example, I'm not really much interested in open resolvers that are um, just coming from uh, buggy boxes. Um, and uh, I'm not also interested in um, resolver being provided by ISP that are not mined and I cannot access to. Um, and the other point is also that having such a list um, also provides a point of control um, of someone deciding who can be in and who is not in, who is out. So in fact, the resolvers available to the end user are mostly contextual. It involves non-public available resolvers, that means provided by the ISP or a company, uh, as well as um, resolver th that could be taken from a pre-selected list maybe, and that are maybe globally available. Next slide. So um, the, how the RDP works, um, it's based on DNS and the central um, concept of the RDP is the resolving domain. Um, resolving domain could be seen as uh, resolver operators that might be able to offer different resolving services. So do, dot, do 53, and, and the creek, etc. So the input for the RDP are two kinds of inputs. It's a resolving domain di directly or a list of resolving domains. In both cases, resolving domains are FQDN and the list of resolving domain is represented by um, FQDN as well. So this is why I'm talking about pointers. Uh, and so how the basic idea is that if you receive a pointers, you retrieve all the list using a PTR request. And when you have a bunch of resol resolving domains for each of those, you're gonna do a SVCB request just to get all the information you need. And then based on that information, you, you proceed to the uh, selection of the resolver. Next slide. So, I mean, DRDP works in two ways. Either you type DRDP minus pointer and uh, the RD underscore pointer dot org or the RDP minus resolving domain and you put the resolving domain rd.org. Next slide. So the information um, that is provided through the SVCB parameters um, it can be extended, of course, uh, and, and we foresee some of those parameters such as uh, user display, which is an indication that might be uh, presented to the end user if end user interaction is needed. You have URI templates, you have um, uh, information such as um, served uh, domain names, uh, preferred relations with some uh, authoritative domain names. Um, you have a filtering, is it, is it something enabled or not? You, you have uh, IP subnets, which defines, uh, which is uh, legitimate to ask for that resolver is the NSA can build on and as well as TLS parameters. Next slide. Um, so the first use case I'm going to present is how do I, um, I, I collect those information from a pointer. So as mentioned earlier, it starts with a PTR request. You get all the resolving domains and then for all the resolving domains that you have, that have been selected by the pointers, or that you collected in, in any other ways, you're gonna do a SVCB um, request and get those parameters. Once you have those parameters, you proceed to the selection. Next slide. So the advantage is uh, mostly that, I mean, the information you receive are up to date and um, each um, resolver operators can update those information, change those and they're reflected to the end user right away. It's not limited to DO. Uh, it, it, we include dot DO and uh, doc, I would say. Um, and it's relatively flexible because we have a SVC params, so it can be used in other contexts. So maybe you, you might retrieve those through uh, maybe um, HTTPS um, uh, request 
or um, in any other ways. I mean, um, that's um, it's also important that we enable all the mechanisms to retrieve those parameters so that the selection can occur. Next slide. So the, the second use case I'd like to go to dig a little bit into is uh, how do I um, do the upgrade, um, how the ISP can provide do. So the, the, um, the, the situation is that currently we have a, an OS, an application, a CPE, and um, a DO53 server provided by the ISP. In some cases, all the traffic goes to the CPE. In other case, you can also have a direct connections to that um, resolver. And uh, the question is, uh, next slide, when the ISP is making available a DO so resolving service, how can the, the OS application or CPE can use that DO server? So, well, the first case I'm considering here is that um, the CPE is not can, cannot be upgraded. So if it can't be upgraded um, and we want to maximize the traffic going through the DOS server, uh, I mean, the, the OS or the application has to contact directly the DOS server. So how we do that, um, we receive the public IPv4 uh, address of the network uh, using STUN or other mechanisms. We perform a DNS lookup, um, on that received domain uh, IP address, and we have received a, um, a, a domain name, which is the one we uh, the ISP um, assigned to that network or set of networks. And then we we use that domain name as a pointer, and so we run the RDP um, over that domain name. So next slide. So that's end up basically in uh, three common line, which is I am discovering the public, my public IP address. I am doing the reverse resolution and I'm running the RDP uh, over uh, my, um, I mean, the discovered uh, name. So the name might be a little bit ugly, but it doesn't really matter. So um, in terms of security, um, what it's, um, what, we discover is actually the server provided by uh, may, maybe not the uh, the ISP you subscribe to, but the ISP that provides you connectivity. So that's relatively close, but uh, we might dig li a little bit more on that. And it requires almost no changes, um, unless a few are sets placed into the, the zone. So next slide. Um, yeah, so you could do similar things uh, with um, the DNS resolvers provided by the ISP um, if that's a global IP address. Uh, but um, I leave that for the draft and I'm gonna move to the next slide. So when the CPE can be upgraded, um, so the CPE can discover also the dual server provided by the ISP, um, but um, the way the CPE is being discovered by the OS or the application is, I would say, I, I, I haven't defined it that how this could be done. Um, and I somehow feel that we, we need to work uh, with DNSSD or HomeNet because the principle here is how you discover a service within the HomeNet. Um, and that's, um, I think, needs a little bit more thoughts. Next slide. So overall, um, what a DRDP is providing is, um, is a way to, um, to use DNS to discover um, a specific, uh, um, I mean, a resolving service that are available to a client. Um, I think the important th things here is that the SVC parameters that we define but that can also be retrieved using other mechanisms that might be more specific to some applications. Um, and it, actually, we don't really care how those um, could be uh, provided uh, as long as we have one that, um, I mean, additional mechanisms are also, um, um, could be also considered. Um, yeah, so, um, 
an important thing is, um, yeah, I, I think it's quite useful to have this notion of pointers because it helps you to define ad hoc and uh, application specific mechanisms to uh, derive from a context a specific pointer. And I think that um, to complete the picture, some um, uh, collaborations with other working groups might be needed. Um, note that uh, given the feedbacks I received on the on this draft, I ended up in two drafts, one which is uh, limited to the RDP and the other one that is focused on how um, an, an OS or an application can discover um, a resolver uh, provided by an ISP. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Uh, unless you have any quick last moment comments, I'm gonna ask actually so that we can keep on schedule um, that if you have feedback for Daniel, please save it for the end of the session when we'll do a longer night mic. So no mic line right now. We'll move on to the next presentation. Yeah, okay. Hi there. Thank and, you. And next, thank you, mm -hmm. Daniel. And next in the queue, we have uh, Tommy Pauly. Tommy, are you here? Okay, Tommy, did I put you in successfully? Yes. All right. Can you hear me? Yeah. Let me bring your presentation up here. All right. You should be able to see me as well. Yes, we can see you and we can hear you. Great. Okay. So in the interest of time, we can just jump right in. Um, I'll be sharing what we have as uh, ADD Resolver Discovery. And this is a collaboration between myself, Tommy Jensen from Microsoft, Eric Kinnear, Patrick McManus, and Chris Wood. Next slide, please. So what I want to talk about today is the use cases that we're trying to solve here. And I think you'll see a lot of overlap and similarity to what Daniel just presented. Um, we want to talk then specifically about the mechanisms that we have for both discovering resolvers as well as learning additional information. And specifically, what I want to highlight is like the points that the authors believe are really central to the design and that we should incorporate into kind of any solution we have in this space and which parts are really bike sheds and those can evolve and change. Next slide, please. So there are two um, primary use cases that we are looking at in this draft. One is to be able to upgrade your resolver that was previously doing um, unencrypted DNS to doing DO or DOT or whatever encrypted DNS we want to have. This is just to make sure that my first hop local network can become encrypted in a way that clients can easily discover. Second use case is to be able to discover what we're calling a designated resolver. That's going to be an encrypted resolver that is applicable for a certain set of domains. And this may be something that's accessible publicly, it may be used for some local breakout on a network, or it may be some enterprise private name. Next slide, please. So in the case of upgrading resolvers, um, this is when we want to move from UDP or TCP based um, resolution to DO or DOT. And this can be applicable either to the resolver that was locally provisioned over DHCP or RAs, and it also applies to something that the user selected, such that if the user typed in quad eight, um, how can we know what the right DO URI is for quad eight without having to have a hard coded list? And we're really only interested in secure upgrade here. Um, if you want to just do some sort of opportunistic thing in which we're not really validating um, the identity of that resolver, we can already do that through DOT. We don't think there is a need to specify anything more. Um, so all the mechanisms we're interested in here are about validating at the very minimum that there is a good resolver certificate that matches the name we expect and that that name has a relationship that we can prove with the original uh, DOE resolver and that this um, new secure resolver is aware of the resolver that was unencrypted that it's coming from. Next slide, please. So merely as a diagram, this use case is saying, I used to have my TO53 server, and I want to be able to switch over to an equivalent DO server or a DOT server. Next slide, please. 
So the second use case is the discovery of a designated resolver. And we want something that is a trusted designation for names within a given zone or a zone hierarchy. And this is effectively giving us split DNS um, with split DNS resolvers. And doing this kind of split DNS approach can solve many problems that are both around um, access as well as improving privacy. So, you know, if I have some public trusted resolver, I may want to know that locally there is locally hosted content that's only going to resolve if I talk to that local resolver. There also may be private names that belong to an enterprise. Um, and if I'm on an enterprise Wi-Fi network, I, I need to know that I need to use the local encrypted resolver to access these. And then we also are interested in identifying um, entities that are authoritative for public content, such that if I'm going to sites within google.com and various subdomains within that, that I can just continue resolving that within a Google um, Do resolver, for example. Next slide, please. So just two quick diagrams to show this. Um, in one case, maybe I have my most traffic is just going to my legacy um, unencrypted ISP resolver. But then I realize that for origin foo, I can access a specific Doe resolver for subdomains within that and can start doing um, my traffic over HTTPS there. Next slide, please. And then the other case is when I have some local resolver that I want to know, and maybe the user has configured a, a public Doe server for all of the traffic, um, we need to know cases in which that will break user experiences because I won't be able to access something that is hosted only locally, such as when I have a enterprise private name. So we want to be able to discover that as well. All right, so that's the use cases. Next slide, please, and we'll go into what we think the requirements are for the discovery mechanism. So this is opinion-based, but we think these are important points. We believe that the discovery of resolvers should be based in the DNS. Um, and we would like to see common semantics for both of these use cases that we've described so far, the upgrade and the designation. We don't want completely separate mechanisms because at the end of the day, what they are describing is the identity of a resolver. Um, for the upgrade case, we believe it makes no sense to have it be based on some special use um, query to the res to the unencrypted resolver itself, because that is a uh, very simple way for the client to say, can I upgrade to something? Here's the information. And then when we're doing a domain-based designation, we believe it's important that this should occur along with the normal name resolution queries that a client is already doing. We don't want to add a whole bunch of extra steps of doing other queries speculatively to see if there is some designation for a zone or a set of names. Um, having this piggyback on traffic that the client will, will already send is best. Next slide, please. So similar to what Daniel shared, we um, think that the service binding records, the SVCB records, are a good fit for this. And this works for both the service binding um, RR type as well as the HTTPS service binding record type. Um, the reasons we believe this is a good fit is that it has a clear extension mechanism within that specific RR type. Um, so this makes it better than things like just a abstract text record. It's something that clients will already start sending um, if they want to support encrypted client hello and TLS um, as they're doing ALPN. This is a record type that, for example, at Apple, we're already um, starting to send out in our beta versions currently. And this also has the right infrastructure to solve multi, oh, sorry, that was a typo on the slide, multi-CDN um, DNS deployment concerns. Um, so it can handle those cases as well. And just to contrast to other solutions, um, using a CNAME record or a text record, are, these are things that are not going to be sent out already for every name. They also don't have strong semantics about what their content is and they're not um, as extensible for various other fields. 
Um, regarding kind of other alternatives to have this information come not through DNS, but come through HTTPS headers, um, this, as we've discussed on list, is detached from the DNS, and this may have more deployment issues. It's not um, necessarily a, a different thing from like a security perspective, but um, I think we would at least want most of this to be rooted in the DNS and maybe we could have those hints on the side, but we think the primary authority for this should be in DNS records. Next slide, please. So that's that was right the now. discovery part. Hmm? Yeah, uh, you've hit time, so maybe okay. we should just jump down to takeaways and next steps. Great, let's do yes. that. Sorry about that. No worries. There, you, you can jump ahead. So essentially this was just saying, like the other proposal, we need additional information. The specific mechanisms, not really important. We, it just should be a dictionary that we can fetch from the resolver. So next slide, the takeaways. Essentially, um, what we're saying here is that we believe that the resolver discovery should use DNS records. We believe that using SVCB as a start is the right place, it's the cleanest, and that any resolver information that we get should be some form of JSON. Um, or something like that type of dictionary. Um, we are using a provisioning domain um, JSON because we think that is the closest existing fit, but that can certainly change. Next slide and last slide. Um, so we are, yeah, we're currently um, trying this out in our iOS and macOS betas. Um, we'd love to continue to refine and consolidate this approach with the other proposals. And um, yeah, we think this is a, Good starting place to um, capture all the different use cases and concerns, and would love to continue working with people. Thank you. All right, thanks, Tommy. Uh, Nick Sullivan, are you around? There you are, requesting thing. There, you, and let me you just say quickly while Nick is uh, getting set up that um, it's the same. Uh, we will have time at the end for a mic line, so if you want to save your feedback for then or for the mailing list. Thank you. Okay, so okay, Nick, you're up, okay. and just let me know um, when you want to jump the slide. Sure, we'll do. Um, okay, so this is a presentation that we gave at some of the uh, preceding meetings to to ADD uh, about a proposal um, for what is the second aspect of um, the charter here, which is defining a mechanism that allows. Uh, communication of resolver information to clients to use in selection decision. This is not a discovery mechanism. It's a selection uh, optimization method uh, at leveraging HTTP. So next slide, please. All right. So in the, um, in the world we're going to be in, in with encrypted DNS, there's potentially multiple resolvers. Uh, this is something that uh, we're, we're looking into finding mechanisms to allow clients to optimally select resolvers. So sending all DNS queries to one DOH provider, uh, if it's a, a cloud pr provider, for example, rather than an ISP provider, it can be uh, inefficient um, and it exposes the entire browsing history to a single uh, provider. Next slide, please. The proposed solution, or, which is potentially one of a suite of solutions here, is to follow the lead of HSTS, which is a header in HTTP that indicates a sticky property about the URI to the client. Uh, with HSTS, uh, the header indicates that next time that you connect to this domain for uh, a period of time, uh, defined by the max age that you should use HTTPS first rather than HTTP. Uh, and with this proposed solution, we are um, including a URI of a DOH server with a max age uh, via HTTP uh, with similar semantics. So it's suggesting to the client that uh, if this domain expires, say, in the local DNS cache, and you need to resolve it again, this is the preferred DNS resolver for this host. 
Um, and this is somewhat different from HSTS in that it's, it's up to the user agent to decide whether to respect this header or not. It's a hint. Next slide, please. Uh, the intended deployment to this would be with browsers that ship with a list of vetted DOH servers. This, uh, again, does not address the discovery um, mechanism because this is a, uh, this is a, this is a proposal that assumes that there are DOH providers that are associated with content providers. And uh, th this is a common scenario that we have right now, and this is helping optimize uh, the relationship of, the, of those two. Um, and so for the browsers, the idea is to follow the DOE preference if the proposed server is on a list that has been vetted or trusted by the browser, um, and content providers can provide a, a vetted DOH server. Uh, the performance and privacy aspects of this, uh, that this improves uh, upon the situation is if the DNS provider is the same as the content provider, then it's, uh, one single entity has access to the browsing information of the user, uh, one that they would get anyways. Uh, and so it's not spread across multiple providers. Next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is a performance feature, not necessarily a security feature. Um, so fallback is allowed um, and fall back to any other DOH server or DNS mechanism, uh, any discovery mechanism. Uh, if you, if the, the browser or the user agent uh, or the OS, wh whatever client it is that is selecting DNS uh, has a chosen list, they can fall back to this. This is just uh, a way to make an optimal DNS provider uh, as, as, as the preference and, and change the priority. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the reason that it makes sense to keep this as a vetted list is that uh, it could potentially be used as a tracking vector if, say, any URI is allowed to be set as uh, for a given domain as the resolving uh, D DNS provider. So um, there are similar worries here with HSTS um, from the super cookie uh, paper and the, the, the idea that you can derive someone's traffic patterns by uh, knowing whether or not certain state has been set on a per domain basis. Um, and so these headers and the selection mechanism should be properly double keyed. Uh, this is just a, a implementation recommendation. Um, so keep a, a static list. This helps you reorganize the static list for a given domain. And uh, it should be tied to the um, the domain and the origin that uh, has set the cookie or has has set the set the header. Uh, next slide, please. Right. So, uh, in conclusion, this is an HTTP based mechanism for uh, improving selection of DOH servers. Uh, given an existing connection to a site, it may know what a more optimal resolver is uh, for that site. And uh, this gives additional control or additional uh, mechanism for the content provider to uh, improve performance for, for DNS, DNS resolution and selection. And uh, yeah, that's it. So short presentation. Okay, thank you, Nick. Um, we're, gonna, we're not taking questions right now. We're gonna hold off until the very end. Um, post them to the list, as Dave said. Um, our next uh, presentation is on bootstrapping procedure to discover and authenticate uh, dot and do servers for IoT and BYOD devices. Dan, are you here? There you are in the queue. Let me turn you on. Okay, you're on the queue, Dan. Let me bring you up your slides. Thanks. Okay. Next You're slide, on. Um, so this uh, this draft talks about bootstrapping IoT devices and bring your own devices, um, and uh, the method of doing a connection handshake and validating the DNS server certificate. Next slide, please. So what we're trying to find are local DOS servers and authenticate against those DOS servers. 
So the primary scope, like I said before, are IoT devices and bring your own devices in enterprise networks. So uh, visiting guests, an employee uh, who is uh, needing to use that network. We have some motivations discussed in the draft and also here for why to use a local server instead of uh, a remote server. Next slide, please. I keep trying to advance slides myself. It's just not working. <laughs> Um, and this is the message flow we are uh, for IoT devices. So we're using Brewski to uh, bootstrap the IoT device and talk to the EST server. And then we are extending Brewski slightly in order to get the name of the DOT uh, or DOE server from the EST server. Next slide, please. Great, one second. Um, and before I get into um, BYOD endpoints, um, we we have received some feedback, you know, that why don't you just use MDM or why don't you use a configuration profile? And what we're trying to do is a, a real BYOD device where they the person does not want to do MDM, which is pretty normal, and doesn't know, doesn't want to do a configuration profile because of the, the vagaries of how much control that gives to, to the enterprise over their own device, which is their own device. Um, so this draft talks about uh, a real, let's call it quote, quote, a real bring your own device, which isn't falling into those categories and how to solve this using protocols. So next slide, please. So for such a device, <clears throat> Uh, we are again talking to an EST server and getting the the information the DNS information uh, from that EST server. Uh, we're using a password based uh, authentication because that's ubiquitous and and common. Uh, we can talk about what to do with that going forward. Um, as we as uh, most folks are familiar, Paik has been under lots of discussion and and uh, modification recently. CFRG is, has seem to have uh, stabilized uh, what they're using and suggesting for that. Uh, and again, here, this is really similar to that uh, message flow for IoT, of course. Uh, we're getting a label uh, that we use to authenticate to that server. And then finally, next slide, please. For both of these techniques, um, how the uh, validation occurs is uh, the DNS server uh, certificate downloaded uh, as from that pointer from the EST server has to match what we uh, connect to over DOE. So in the TLS handshake that has to match. And that's uh, an additional requirement from EST is, is that it also be a trusted certificate on the certificate trust store on the local device. That's it, thank you. Next slide, please. Thank you. Wow, uh, you're helping us keep to our time. Thank you very much <laughs> on that one. That was terrific. That um, is important. Yes. Um, so we, we have actually a couple of minutes. We can allow a couple quick Q and A's on this particular draft. Anybody want to jump in quickly? Suggest that uh, while the other presentations were fresh in our mind, if there was feedback on them, that would be okay too, because we do have a solid five plus minutes um, ahead of schedule right now. So Sam's back in queue, let's take Sam. You're on Sam. Oh, you well, were. He you just was and he went away. Hang on, here's uh, back. back you. Okay. You're back, there Sam. You. Can't hear you. You cannot hear me. Now no, we you're, can. you're 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 soft. Speak, speak up. Great. Um, this is a question about the hints proposal. You compared it to HSTS. I wonder if it's also runs a risk of fingerprinting in the way that HSTS can be used as a super cookie. Can people set up a series of domains to save some state in the browser? I see Nick thank you to answer. Yeah, so uh, I hinted at that at the end as, as a risk. It's, it's listed in the document. Uh, the, for HSTS and for um, generally cookies and super cookie tracking, uh, double keying, 
is uh, an accepted solution that seems to uh, solve most of these issues. So you, if if you look at the browser and the um, the host that's actually in the URL bar as well as the host name that's setting the cook setting the the, the the header. If you use both of those as uh, keys for keeping the state, then uh, super cookie tracking generally uh, is less effective. Sure. If you, okay. I think I understand. Um, that was not clear from my read of the draft, and so you might want to clarify that a little more. In it. Okay. Thanks. Hey, uh, Ralph Paper. Oh, he 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 dropped out. <laughs> He'll probably be back while while he's jumping back in. I'll just make a quick comment that we are definitely taking note of the um, of the conversation happening in Jabber about um, you know the uh, trying to find a useful path here from all the drafts and um, and that a lot of them are basically just summarizing the existing draft comments. Uh, uh, you know uh, the existing published drafts and uh you know we can't just say oh we're gonna you know well this is what the interim for is for and so to the extent that um unfortunately some of this time has been a bit redundant with what's happened over the past two weeks we will be working to try to figure out how we how we do map a path forward yeah so hey dave i i noticed um we've there seems to be some weird thing going on with uh, Meet Echo. It's it's occasionally popping up with the MP not found error message. I've tried to let Ralph do the video a couple times now, and and it has failed huh. both times. Okay. Well, if Ralph, if you can hear us and pop in the queue one more time, I'll just see if it makes any difference. If I'm the one that clicks the button. He's still not showing up in queue. So. Okay. Okay, yeah, I think um, we'll move on then to um, uh, Mohammed's presentation. Yeah, yeah, so the next presentation is probably Mohammed. Let me bring that one up. And. Hey, Mohammed, you're on. If you, and uh, let me know when you want to jump slides. Yeah, th thank you, thank you, Glenn. Yes, so this this will be, I uh, would say, a short presentation of the um, an update of what we have done in this um, in the home net, uh, network drafts. Um, so this is about, I would say, the discovery of the um, as obviously about the uh, discovery of the encrypted DNS. And by encrypted DNS, we mean uh, DNS over TLS, DNS over HTTPS, DNS over Quick, or whatever um, encrypted DNS that will be defined in the in the future. So, if you can just move to the next slide, uh, that will just show the structure of this presentation. So, we will just provide, I would say, a scope and a, a reminder of the approach. So, even if we know that people have already, at least we hope that they have already read the draft, we, we will just provide a reminder of, I would say, the approach that is taken in this draft. And then we will focus on the uh, main changes that we made since the last presentation that were made by Dan last time. And then there is uh, a focus on one discussion point uh, before jumping into uh, next steps for this uh, for this specification, hopefully. Next slide, please. So this is this is just to uh, to focus why why we think that this draft is within the scope of the chart of this working group. So we are targeting mainly this this working item from the uh, from the charter is the, the discovery of the um, the DNS resolver. Let it be uh, available on the public internet, private or a local network. So. Um, with this with, with this item, what we have in mind is to uh, to propose a mechanism for, for that, but with a very focus on the home networks, uh, the, which has many many specifics that are shown in the next slide. Um, so um, the, one of the aspects or the particularity which is shown um, here is that there is the presence of this component which is called the CP. So the CP is, is really important to provide multiple services in which the DNS is is, 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 is particularly involved. So there's the, um, the availability to provide, I would say, local services, um, the optimize, for instance, the latency for the resolution because you have, I would say, uh, more localized cache because you have already a cache that is already embedded in the CP. Um, there's also, I would say, multiple security um, uh, functions that are supported by the CP, for instance, to isolate some infected devices or 
to collaborate with the network for the um, for the sake of I would say um, uh, better filtering of some uh, hosts that are infected and are that are contributing to send this attack. So uh, I won't list all of them, but this is something that is really important to remind to uh, to uh, so that we can have this in picture so that uh, there are already services that are there and they are making using of I would say of the DNS and it will be if we are defining architecture for the introduction of uh, encrypted DNS, we need at least to, uh, to have solutions so that this can be accommodated. Next slide, please. So what's the approach that, that were, I would say, um, uh, adopted for this draft? So the first one is that there is already existing solutions for the discovery of DNS, and we are just leveraging on that. We are building on existing mechanisms to, for discovery, I would say, of the DNS, and we are just enhancing or at least enriching that information with, with the specific information which is required for the encrypted DNS, uh, mainly the uh, what we call the EDNN, which, which will be used for the authentication. So we have multiple channels that are defined the draft, you have the DCP, DCPv6, and we have also the, uh, the router ad advertisement. We, are, we can also add into the list the, what we call the PCO, which is specific to the mobile networks, but this is already something we should discuss in the draft. And we, these mechanisms are used in, um, within the home network itself, between the CP and uh, the hosts that are within the, uh, the home network, or between the CP and another router that can be in, in, in the home network. And this can also be used between the, uh, the network provide, access provider and the home network in order to retrieve, I would say, a list of the, um, uh, the DNS servers that are offered by the, um, by the um, access providers. So the, the typical communication flow is really, I would say, basic so that the client can say that if it is interested to receive um, a particular, for instance, encrypted DNS, it can indicate that in the, in the records that you can send to, to the network to say that, hey, I'm interested to receive information about DOT or, or, or any available encrypted DNS that, that you, you are supporting. And then the, uh, the network will send back the, uh, I would say the information about this encrypted DNS if supported by the, by, 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 by the network. Next slide, please. So well, here in this slide, we are summarizing the, um, the main changes that we made since the last time. So there's the discussion about how we, we can discover the URI templates. There is another point about, I would say, the, how we can involve the forwarder in, into the, the CPE. And we added also, I would say, we, I, I, will, I will zoom in the, on the first one in the, in the next slide, but um, uh, just we, um, in, uh, to mention that we have also, I would say, include a new section about the legacy CPEs, how the legacy CPEs can discover, I would say, if there is no support of these new options, how a legacy CP can discover the encrypted DNS. And then we uh, we also I would say updated the security security section with additional I would say discussion to cover both I would say the active and passive attacks. Uh, in the next slide, we'll focus on the uh, on the one about the um, the, uh, the change we made about the uh, the discovery of the uh, URL template. We used to have in the previous version of the of the of the specification to have I would say many ways to to do that. We we thought about, I would say, or at least this can this, this was discussed on the list. How whether we can discover, I would say, the URL templates directly using the um, the uh, the GPO option or, or the route route assessment option, or to receive that directly from from the server. And finally, we went to this the the, the one to uh, to retrieve this information directly from the from the server. Uh, so we are just leveraging on the uh, a well known URI which is defined in another draft. Uh, which is the, um, the resolver information. Um, so the, the client will build, will build a, uh, I would say, uh, a URL based on the EDN that will be conveyed in the HTTPO option and this will known URI so that it can communicate directly with the uh, resolver in order to retrieve the template can be used and also additional information. And by the way, we are using this well-known URI for also for direction, uh, but this is really uh, something which is out of scope of the specification and it is de defined somewhere else. Next slide, please. So here we, we, we simplified uh, the procedure for involving the forwarder in the CP. We used to have, I would say, many options and many solutions to, uh, to, to do that, that one. Uh, so we finally uh, picked this one to, to say that uh, it would be really good to, to, to simplify how the CP can be involved to provide the, the DNS forwarder. So basically the, uh, the solution is, is, is as follows. So the, uh, the service providers will assign names to the CP and it will push some certificates to the CP itself. 
Um, and then the uh, once the CPS has received a trigger from the, I would say, the access provider, or this is configured directly by the ad administrator of the CP that the, the, the encrypted DNS is supported. So the, the DHCP or the, the uh, router advertisement options um, will be used by the CP to advertise the name that will that is already assigned by a service provider to, uh, to to the host to say that this is the name I, I am using. And then the uh, the host it, it will auto upgrade based on the name that will be provided by the CPE. But the, how the uh, auto upgrade is done, this is something really that is beyond the discovery. Uh, but uh, we, we discussed in the draft solutions so that the auto upgrade can be based on wildcard, I would say, validations on, on, on the name that will be provided by the CPE. Uh, so as shown in the uh, in the next slide, there is an example of how this auto upgrade can be done but, um, bet uh, by, by, the, by, by the application, uh, the previous one, please. Okay, uh, which is that the slide you want, or you want a previous slide? No, the the, the previous one. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so th this one is support that there is a, the wild the the um, the, um, the wildcard matching is supposed that there is an out of band negotiation between the client and the uh, service provider to allow this kind of off filtering. And by the way, this is only an example of how we can do auto upgrade. And the, in, in the draft, we are, I would say, because there is some limitation of this approach which is about the scaling and so on, and we have already discussed a solution so that the auto upgrade can be based on the some um, uh, cryptography um, verifications um, um, done by the client itself. Next slide, please. This is one of the, I would say, of the uh, pending issues that, uh, or at least the um, one of the um, points that we would like to have more um, feedback from the uh, from the working group. Currently, we are um, communicating the IP addresses of the servers in the existing options, and we are just defining the new, I would say, specific uh, information for the encrypted DNS in, in, in new ones. And this one is really, I would say, um, straightforward if the um, the various connections are terminating on the same ser ser uh, server. That is that the same server, for instance, is providing both, I would say, DOT or DOH and the um, uh, the legacy DNS. Uh, that's one we we don't increase. I would say the size of the, the discovery messages themselves, but it it may be um, inefficient if we we um, the servers that that are offering the various services are not are not hosted on the same device. So um, if we want to, um, to 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 convey multiple IP addresses, in such case, um, there, there is uh, the current approach in the draft is that the, the client will just probe the, I would say the various list that will be provided by the by the network, tell um, it will it will decide whether this is DOT or, or DOT and so on. This one may be inefficient. So an alternate design is to um, include in the same new option that we are defining, not only the name of the server themselves, but also a, a list of IP addresses. Uh, this one, it solves the inefficiency for um, the, for the case when there is, I would say, the server that are not terminate, that the um, if multiple servers are used to terminate uh, multiple flavors of the DNS, uh, but it is not uh, efficient if the same server is used for uh, all the variant of the uh, uh, of the DNS services. So we really want to to hear from the um, from the working group about this one. Um, uh, I, Oh, there is also one, I would say, one companion point for this one is the uh, whether we want also to discover the port number. I, I know that Christian with him is, is suggesting to have, I would say, this additional information to be conveyed in the um, in the message themselves. So we are open to uh, to, to this and to uh, to uh, to modify if there is, I would say, um, an agreement between people who are interested in, in this work to include that in the design. Um, in the next two slides, we are just, I would say, summarizing the, um, the some frequent um, question that we are we have on this. I would say on, on this draft is um, mainly we, we are not mandating the, the CPE to be a managed one. So it's really fine if you have your own CPE, uh, but if the CPE is supporting DOH or an encrypted DNS, so that you can just configure it. And if there is an interface which is provided by that CPE, it's it just it's, it's, the option that we are defining the drive can be just used to uh, to share or to disseminate the information within the home network. Likewise, we don't mandate that the um, the information that will be used in this option are necessarily those of the ESP. That's just one deployment option. It's it's it's, uh, it's completely fine that the, the options that are defined in this draft are used to um, to uh, to uh, to advertise your favorite the um, uh, DNS server. Likewise, we are not mandating the uh, the ESP to be always. I would say behaving as a forwarder. This is something which is really configuration configuration based and de deployment specific. And in the next slide, 
we are focusing on, on two, uh, I would say, uh, two points. The first one is that there is, I would say, uh, some comments um, about, I would say, yeah, to say that the CP may not be um, um, adequate to host um, a DNS, I would say, for order because because it is not um, of some security vulnerability. So this, I would say, at least this comment is is really. Um, it can apply also for uh, for applications, for browsers, and so on. Uh, but the uh, the key point here is that yes, this, this may be a, a valid point for some CPs, but there are a lot of uh, CPs out there who are doing a lot of work and enormous work to so that to harden the the CPA themselves and to to offer I would say better security protection and so on. And there is regular uh, updates and upgrades of the CP of the CPs to align with the I would say recent security BCPs and so on. So in the in the meantime, there is also the the comment about whether we can upgrade the the CP. Yes. The, there may be some CP that cannot upgrade it because there is some limitation of the hardware or because the CP is not managed or because there is no, I would say, interface offered by the vendor of that CP to, 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 uh, to update the firmware and, say, uh, and so on. But in the meantime, there are also, I would say, CPs on the field that are, there are millions that are deployed there. And for instance, we are offering a lot of managed CPs that are, we are regularly updating and upgrading um, uh, to, to provide new, uh, new firmware, new configurations, and it is right. So um, the key point her, here is that, yes, we are, I would say, aware of some limitation that can be for some CP devices, but not this limitation does not apply to, to all the CPs there. And the CP is important to provide, I would say, a lot of services to, to the users today. And there are, I would say, rooms to uh, so that we can accommodate this conference to provide the encrypted DNS. So this will let me move to the next slide, which will uh, conclude my presentation. Uh, so this is, an, um, I would say, um, an open question to, to the working group, whether there is interest to continue working on this one. Right. And uh, of course, we're not going to <laughs> be talking about discussing adopting the draft right now. And uh, we do have to move on. So thank you, Mohammed. I'm not sure whether Michael is coming back or no, nope, Thierry's here. OK. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. We can. Hey. Hey, great. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Thiru. I'll be presenting our updates to the DNS server selection draft. Next slide, please. Uh, so I'll be only presenting the uh, delta between 00 and 04. Uh, the first version of the draft was presented at IET of uh, 107 by Dan. Next slide, please. Uh, so what we have done in the uh, from 00 to 04 is uh, update the uh, draft to ex uh, explicitly explain its purpose that it can be used to attest both the DNS server identity and uh, resolver information. Uh, the rest of the steps in these slides are already there and discussed in the previous version, so I will not be going over them. But the whole idea is to discover uh, the resolver information to feed into the selection process and then to uh, find the DNS server privacy statement URL and audit URL and uh, notify the user whenever the uh, there is an update to the URL. Uh, this draft is not discussing any uh, privacy claims. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, why do you need to attest the uh, DNS server identity? Now, um, as you can see, many of the drafts uh, that are currently discussed in this working group have insecure discovery mechanisms like DHCP or specially used domain names. Uh, in those cases, it would be definitely useful for the endpoint to know whether uh, these servers are indeed uh, hosted by an legitimate organization or by an attacker. Uh, in today's world, it's very easy for an attacker to uh, get a domain validated cert uh, and, or even get an IP address cert using uh, Act so uh, this helps uh, our pro uh, to solve that problem where the DNS server attestation will help the identity uh, endpoint to know uh, uh, whether it's hosted by a specific organization, for example, the organization the user is working for or the ISP uh, he's, uh, he, uh, he or she is using in his uh, for uh, internet access. Uh, <clears throat> uh, how do we do that? Uh, so what we are doing is, uh, hello. You're, 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 we can hear you. OK, uh, I can hear a echo. Hello? Yeah, you're fine. Just keep talking. You're coming through clearly. OK, so the uh, we are using OEV certificates uh, registered to organizations to crypto regularly assess the DNS server identity. Uh, the rest one, of the one, information see, that if is I can, If I can jump in one second. When you talk very, very fast, it, it does kind of uh, get a little garbled. So maybe just slow down just a wee bit.
Are you still there? Yeah, uh, uh, my uh, media go just crashed. Hello, can you hear me now? We can hear you, yes. Yeah. Okay. So what we are doing is, uh, since there is no, uh, we are relying on uh, organization validated and EB certs uh, registered to organization to cryptographically uh, test the DNS server identity. Uh, uh, even uh, an organization which could have uh, performed a security and privacy audit of the uh, DNS server uh, could provide uh, and attest the uh, the DNS server identity and its uh, resolver information. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the CA that issued the uh, OVEV certificate does not attest the DNS server entity. It's done by the organization which is uh, hosting the uh, uh, DNS server. Uh, we are relying on uh, JSON Web Tokens and JSON Web Signatures, uh, where we have uh, uh, one mandatory signature by the organization hosting the uh, duty device server, and optionally uh, uh, another signature by a third party, uh, uh, which would have audited the duty device server. Nowadays, if you see uh, many third parties uh, are, are auditing uh, VPN providers, especially uh, for privacy reasons, and uh, one of them could do a privacy and security audit of the DOTD with server. Uh, we're currently relying on uh, uh, the RSN4 resource card type using JSON to convey the uh, uh, resolver information and the DNS server identity. Next slide. Uh, as per the discussion in the working group, we have updated the uh, DNS filtering capabilities to include uh, uh, two new uh, uh, reasons for filtering. One is uh, policy blocking to align with the uh, the extended error codes in DNS of working group, which is to say uh, the organization has an internal policy for blocking access to subspecific domains. Uh, the fourth one is uh, uh, censored blocking. Censored blocking is introduced to uh, support a case where uh, an ISP or an enterprise network uh, blocks certain domains because of law enforcement agencies or a court order. Uh, the other change is basically to support a flag to indicate whether the DNS server uh, requires the client to authenticate. Uh, for example, this could be a case where an endpoint is roaming outside the ISP or outside the enterprise network and it still wants to use the uh, DOH or DOT services that's provided by the enterprise or ISP networks. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Uh, that's an sample of the PAT object, which includes the DNS server identity, the time it was issued, its expiry time, and the policy information on the filtering capabilities and a pointer to the privacy URL statement and the audit URL statement by a third party uh, uh, agency, which has done security and privacy audit of the uh, DNS server. Next slide. Yeah, uh, any comments on this draft are welcome. Thank you. And we're going to take those discussions at the end. So moving on to our next speaker, it is Andrew Campling. Andrew, let me bring up your slides. And let me turn your video on and your audio. You're you're set to go, Andrew. Great. Uh, thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, OK, so I'm going to not talk about uh, discovery and selection, but instead to uh, eff effectively flesh out the network operator use case. Um, uh, the summarizing input uh, uh, with, um, and you'll see my co-authors listed. And just on this first slide, I spotted a typo just before the call started. Uh, so with apologies to Norman, is uh, he's at telecom with a K dot DE. Uh, next slide, please. Um, if you, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> if you look at the uh, paper, you'll see that it's uh, based uh, on input from uh, multiple network operators who between them have got several tens of millions of uh, users um, and obviously therefore sorry tens of millions of customers and therefore significantly more users um, than that um, uh, these are uh, these are principally european uh, network operators. Uh, the intent behind the paper is to just bring to life what the current uh, sort of prevalent network architecture is, um, specifically in Europe, uh, because it was apparent from some of the discussions that that is perhaps not as widely known as it could be. Um, and therefore, knowledge of that will aid 
those that are developing um, uh, discovery and uh, selection uh, solutions. Um, and the requirement here clearly is to uh, come up with uh, uh, discovery and selection uh, of resolvers um, that will work with minimal disruption uh, for the end users. Uh, next slide, please. Um, just to highlight some of the key um, uh, so aspects of the uh, prevalent uh, uh, architecture um, within certainly European um, operators. Um, again, there's more detail clearly in the uh, uh, in the ID. Um, firstly, um, I think pretty much without exception, the network operators uh, typically run non-public um, resolvers, um, uh, so uh, closed resolvers, um, in other words. Um, also, um, the CP is typically um, on private IP addresses. Um, uh, so therefore, uh, that needs to be borne in mind for discovery. Um, and the CP typically will operate as a DNS forwarder. Um, uh, uh, so uh, uh, the actual access from the uh, on-network devices to uh, DNS is through the CPE. Um, by observation of the data from these network operators, manual configura configuration of DNS is not undertaken by the majority of users. Um, the it average varies ever so slightly, but it's around 90% of users have not manually configured their DNS. So again, that needs to be borne in mind um, in terms of de developing any discovery solutions. Um, and as I uh, said earlier, um, this architecture is widely used, certainly um, in Europe. Um, there are valid reasons for wanting DNS forwarding um, on CPE. Um, and again, these are detailed um, with, within the document. Um, and importantly, uh, they do give good privacy, security and performance benefits to the uh, users. Um, so that should be borne in mind um, that, that, that there, are, there is a, a, a rationale for using uh, this particular architecture. Uh, next slide, please. So the uh, sort of noting those uh, architecture observations, the challenges um, as we see them um, are that the current um, same provider auto upgrade mechanisms uh, typically fail because the client DNS resolver uh, is a private IP address um, and uh, therefore um, uh, the, the uh, same provider auto upgrade uh, uh, as currently implemented does not work. Um, and, and given that most uh, users don't manually configure um, their DNS, um, that needs attention um, because they, they will be relying on auto discovery. Um, especially as if you move to manually configuring a closed resolver, if the client software fails, if, um, if, uh, if it can't access that resolver, if it fails closed specifically, again, that is a problem. Um, and some of the current um, uh, client software will fail closed if it can't discover um, the closed resolver, which obviously will occur uh, if the uh, user device is not connected uh, to the uh, operator's network. Uh, it should also be borne in mind in Europe, just to complicate matters slightly, that uh, uh, consumers do actually have a legal right to use their own provided CPE. They don't have to use that provided by the network operator. Um, and importantly, um, should the working group uh, choose to obsolete um, uh, the uh, model uh, that's implied by this network architecture, um, it will obviously impact on the operators um, that chose those architectures um, and therefore impact on the privacy, security and performance benefits that their several tens of millions of users currently derive uh, from those architectures. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, um, uh, the, the, the network use operator use case is clearly valid, uh, given that it is used by tens of millions of, uh, of, uh, of users. Um, the requirements as outlined um, are common um, and widespread. 
um, and we do therefore need discovery solutions that will work with this uh, DNS forwarder private IP to closed resolver approach. Um, and uh, auto discovery um, that works with that approach um, uh, is important. Um, and I would certainly recommend that any ADD solutions for discovery or selection should be measured against this use case to see whether they address it. Um, and it's uh, certainly imperative that at least one mainstream ADD solution is provided that does indeed uh, meet this use case. Um, and with that, I think I've used my time, so I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And with that, I'll bring up the very last thing uh, by Neil Cook. Um, and let me say thank you to all the speakers so far. You've done a terrific job of keeping us on track, which would give us some time at the end for some discussion. So, Neil, do I need to let you in? Thanks, Quinn. I'll keep this brief. Um, next slide. Hang on, I'm having some mouse focus problems. Here we go. Okay, so um, this came about uh, it, it really in response to the, this, the things that, that Andrew just discussed, um, the, the whole send provider auto upgrade mechanism that uh, uh, Chrome, uh, Windows, uh, we're, we're doing just basically doesn't support forwarders uh, in CPUs. Um, next slide. So uh, I just, just we just came up with a kind of interim proposal, which is very similar to ResInfo, uh, which we actually like, I like. Um, I'm surprised it's not actually being discussed here. Uh, and also similar to the to the, uh, the draft that uh, EKR submitted around about the what they're doing with, with Comcast. So basically does a, a special use domain name query for a text record and gets a DOH URI back. Um, next slide. So it does the query, gets the text record back, and then the, the resulting DOH connection clearly then bypasses the CPE. So even though the CPE is actually doing the forwarding initially, at once DOH is established, then the, the, the connection bypasses the CPE. Next slide. Um, that you, so you could make this work in a kind of, in the same, using the same kind of safe list approach that, uh, that the, uh, Chrome uh, Windows folks are, are, are using. Um, you don't have to. You have a safe list of safe list of sites in the same way, uh, and similar to what the what the uh, draft that uh, EKR submitted about what they're doing with Comcast. Uh, you could also safe list list it only to close resolvers if you really wanted to. Next slide. Uh, clearly, this is opportunistic. Everything that I think that uses DNS to do this is opportunistic. That doesn't, for my, in my opinion, at least. I mean that we shouldn't do it. Uh, it it's uh, it essentially it's no worse than 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 the existing situation because attackers on the local network or in the access network could could already already hijack uh, DNS today. But it does move at the end of that. You, you end up with an encrypted connection, which has privacy benefits, etc. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neil. So that's the end of our uh, speaker list. And we baked in a few minutes for discussion. L let me just uh, answer it, because I, I think there's some questions floating around about the interim. So we're the goal is to give people a sufficient time at the interim to discuss. Uh, I guess one could sort of view the interim as a way to look at uh, the replacement for what we might have been able to do in the hallways after this session uh, if we were all physically in Madrid. We would probably go off, get a bottle of wine, sit down, argue a little bit, and come up with some proposals. Uh, failing that, uh, the idea is to give us time in September, and, and it wasn't possible because of all the competing sessions at ITF 108 to try to block out time today or this week. Uh, so the next real slot that comes up available for everybody is September. The idea then being that we can sit down, spend the time it takes to discuss, and then move forward. Okay, so that's sort of the level setting, what Dave and I have been thinking uh, about the, the flow of things to come. Okay, that said, Dave, I'll turn it over to you to manage the, the uh, speaker queue. Yeah, I just uh, want to actually invite a, a couple of people because as I mentioned a little while ago, we are definitely taking note of the feeling that this was not a particularly useful session because it was just a recounting of things that you've already read and seen on the list. Um, we do have a 25 minute block now for 
discussion, um, the we, we recognize that this was kind of a scattershot tour through everything that's out there. Um, a big blast of the shotgun, as I think Barry referred to it. And uh, so I would actually invite you just uh, while there is a Jabber log, I'd like to uh, I see Martin in the queue, for example, to uh, come to the mic and, and just say what your experience with this was. And uh, if I could also perhaps invite Barry to uh, jump in with, um, you know, kind of the thinking of the direction we're, we're going to try to be going on this. Um, but uh, right off, we'll uh, start with Martin. You're on, Martin. You'll have to be with me. Um, so, um, I've got to say, it's 1.30 in the morning, I'm not exactly coherent. Um, this really wasn't very helpful for me. I read all the drafts, I've seen all the presentations before. Um, what I was looking for out of this discussion, and I'm glad we do have the time, is what are we going to do next? And I see too many options in this list. I would like to have just one thing that we can concentrate on. And my proposal is that we address what um, the previous two presenters were talking about, which is trying to work out how we can do something about the same provider auto upgrade scenario, maybe considering the constraints uh, that, that Andrew presented. I think they're perfectly reasonable constraints. Um, and I think we had some proposals along those lines that would have addressed most of those sorts of things. The problem is that they're buried in so much extra craft that I'm having a lot of trouble understanding what's going on because we're talking about the BYO devices, we're talking about EST, it's just too much. We need to cut this back down to something that's that's going to be deployable. Uh, yes, I agree. In fact, I'll read into the record your comment uh, that you had sent to Jabber, just saying, I suggest that we agree on which problems we want to solve, that agree on what principles apply to each, then have small, uncomplicated drafts that enact those choices. So thank you, Martin. Uh, Paul. Uh, Paul Hoffman, I just tried to grant you access, but I don't see you in the, there you go. Okay. Um, yep, so uh, I actually don't need to say anything because you just read out, I, I wasn't following Jabber, but whatever Martin just said that you read out is exactly right. Um, the These presentations were about, we came up with solution and we, we or, I'm sorry, the presentations in the first part of this meeting was, we have this solution and here is the problem uh, that we had. I think that we need to start from a problem statement. Um, that's what, what Puneet and I started with, with ResInfo, which didn't get presented today, but has already been discussed heavily on, on the list, um, is, is, you know, if we shoot low, then uh, for, for what is needed, then lots of different solutions pop out. If we shoot too high, we're going to restrict um, how many users actually get to encrypt their you know, the traffic. Um, so let's let's all agree on at one or maybe two use cases where we say this is what we want to do, and then start over on the protocol work. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Joey Salazar me um so i agree i think we need some consolidation there's lots of areas that are overlapping um but i also think that um, talking about home devices and bring your own devices is still necessary maybe just not now so maybe like the others have said oh i apologize for the background noise uh, maybe like the others have said maybe uh refocus um the areas that we're working now and maybe do like a layered approach that once we cover like uh, the fundamentals for the discovery themselves, then we can start talking again about the uh, home devices and the uh, bring your own devices and such. Yeah, thank you, Joey. Uh, EKR. We don't hear you transmitting yet. Yeah, now thank you. Yeah. There you go. So I agree with what the previous people said. Um, uh, um, in the spirit of that, it seems to me that we have a minimum two problem statements. One is um, steering which 
generic resolver will be used by um, by endpoints, by client endpoints, and the other is allowing um, uh, origins to specify specific resolvers to be used for them or some aff other affiliated, um, you know, demands. Um, and if so, if, and so some of these drafts did one, some of these drafts did both. Um, so in particular, draft poly does both. Um, uh, uh, as just we tackle them separately because um, they're actually not that closely related, even if they ended up using some of the same mechanisms. The um, on the in the first uh, category, it seems to me that the question, the primary questions, um, surround uh, authentication, um, how you determine which um, which whether resolver is a correct resolver, and um, how and what the role of CPE is. In particular. Um, does this have to connect to the CPE, as Andrew suggested, um, and um, or does it have, or should it bypass the CPE? And and if it bypasses the CPE, what should be the um, you know what mechanisms will allow it to bypass the CPE properly? So in particular, like I see people talking about using like you know DHCP, and the question is, will that work if the CPE isn't upgraded? Um, so some of these mechanisms are designed to work with non-upgraded CPE, and some are not. Um, so. Um, you know, I know nobody loves like requirements documents, but I think the place to start is by trying to nail in those requirements, um, in particular in this case, because otherwise we're just going to have like a, a mess of different things, but all of, all of which do all of which do some or other things. So I think we need to figure out, you know, what's the role what's the role of the CPE there, and what's the security model. Thank you, Eckert. Uh, oh, Ralph, you you only requested video. Okay, so your video is up, but you didn't request audio. And Jim, I trying to fix Ralph. I put you live, but you're gonna have to wait on that. Okay. So, okay, it's Ralph that's up. Please try talking. We see your video, but the audio lags a little bit. Now, oh, you went. Okay, you are. Trying to be audio enabled, Ralph. Yeah, and we've definitely got your video. I think this might unfortunately be a situation where you're gonna have to like hit a jabber scribe to get your comments in because your video is just not coming, uh, your audio is just not coming through. So can you hit a jabber scribe and I'll put you uh, back in right after Jim Reed. Okay, thank you. So go okay. ahead, Jim. Th thanks, Dave. I agree wholeheartedly with the comments that Martin, Paul, and Eckert have just made. Um, we need a lot more focus and structure to what's going on. And I think probably part of the solution here is not just uh, the issues of problem statements, we also need to look at some of the use cases. And I think that would help frame some of the discussion about the drafts. To some degree, I think we've kind of put the cat before the horse by coming up with impl implementation solutions before we really understand the problem space. And we need to go back and look at those things first. And maybe that could help shape the discussion for the interim meeting in September. I know, for example, in the last few days, we've had a lot of chat about GDPR and what particular impacts that might or might not have. But we don't have any definitive information about that. And that would be one area where I think a clearer understanding of what the GDPR issues are or might be would help inform the discussion about what we do next. And again, hopefully that can be organized in time for the interim meeting in September. Cheers. Okay, thank you very much, Jim. Um, Ralph is still typing into Jabber, I'm guessing. So, Eric Ward, you're up. Oh, am I transmitting audio? Yes. Okay, great. So, I mean, just my personal conclusion from a bunch of the drafts we've seen today, I see three big overlapping areas that were covered by a lot of these that would be great if they could be basic if we did some consolidation and reorganization and make each of these areas just one nice clear draft. One was discovering potential upgrade or other information from a given resolver, whether that's current resolver or some other resolvers. There's a lot of stuff around the res info, which wasn't actually presented today, but we a lot of know about it. Then there's all the stuff about just either a DNS lookup to the current resolver to get more information, stuff like that. Um, the second big overlapping area I saw was all the stuff about domain designated resolvers. So it's just any mechanisms for domains to tell you what their preferred resolver is. And then the third overlapping area I've seen today is just everything around networks communicating what their preserved resolver is. 
I think that would be a very go a very long way towards all the things this working group is trying to solve if we made one good clear draft for each of those three areas. And that's all I've got to say. Thank you. Great, thank you, Eric. Uh, I'm jumping with Ralph's comment now. Um, he had said basically that he agrees with a lot of the comments before we should do the easy one resolver upgrade first. And we do have a solution for designating domains. It's regular resolving. If people want that, then they should work with DeepRive on securing recursing to the authoritative. And that was Ralph's comment. Uh, he can add more if he likes later, but now uh, Ecker is back. You're on, Eric. Not intentionally. Oh, oh OK. So me out. <laughs> OK. Uh, ben Schwartz is up, but he's only requested video. So Ben, request audio, too. and. There we go. OK, Ben, you're up. So I'll just say that uh, I agree with this, this wave of sentiment, uh, but I think we actually did do this in the right order. Uh, I think that we're now in a much better position to write up a requirements draft because thanks to all the people in the working group, we've really explored this problem space very thoroughly. And I think that turned up some corners of the problem space or corners of the solution space that I think are really interesting and, and wouldn't wouldn't have surfaced otherwise like the uh, the C name draft that, that wasn't mentioned today which uh, addresses some interesting interaction between our discovery requirements and the get at or info API uh, I think that we can now take those observations and feed them back into a requirements document based on now uh, what we know to be possible great thank you Ben um, that was actually the end of the queue. Uh, I would once again like to invite uh, Barry to comment if he would like to offer any comments. I, I would, thanks. This is Barry Leba. Uh, yeah, I, I think the last couple of comments have been um, related to what I was going to say. I sent a note during the session to the chairs saying what sounds to me uh, like the path forward is to have the working group now with all of these proposals and others that weren't covered here take a look at and figure out what topics you really do want to work on and um uh, one of the erics had a, a good list of those and, and other people have theirs and distill that down into something that we can assign that the chairs can assign um editors for to write up from the beginning rather than adopting something that uh, that goes beyond what the working group wants to work on build it up within the working group and i think that will uh, serve the working group's best interests uh, but of course it's up to the chairs how to run that that's just my suggestion okay thank you and uh just to not overlook also that Alyssa has been here if she wanted to jump in with any comments uh, no obligation of course but um I guess this would be your opportunity as it looks like the session is coming to a close. Oh, she's here. I don't, uh, sorry, I was uh, multitasking, but um, yeah, no yeah it, I don't think I have anything to add. I think my views have been reflected already. Great. OK, uh, so that will bring our session to a close a little early. Again, kind of sorry that the initial part of it did not work as well for people as what they were hoping. But I think we have actually gotten some some good ideas about how we're going to be moving forward from here. Um, Glenn, would you like to wrap up? Did you, uh, when you mentioned the poll again, did you happen to mention the time of day? Um, I, yeah, I might have so been focused on Jabber at the moment. Yeah, no, I dropped into the Jabber um, uh, because you know, I'm trying to multitask here. Uh, so the thinking right now is that the interim would probably be held sometime early um, uh, Pacific time where I live. So we're talking maybe six or seven a.m. Uh, that would bring it to uh, you know a mid morning time uh, East Coast U.S. And because we have a large number of UK and uh, European participants, that would be their afternoon. Uh, and I apologize, you know, we, we have this globe thing that's causing us grief and time zones for people that are not fitting in the, into the European North American time zone space. I, I, if you got a solution or a suggestion how we can make a time zone fit better, I'm always eager to hear that one. <laughs> uh, but I, 
what I'm hearing, you know, sort of is, I think, a good lead in then to what we've been talking about for the the uh, September uh, time where people will have time to discuss. Uh, and if we can find some people in between now and then to do some of this, uh, as Barry suggested, I like his suggestion on doing some uh, sort of, you know, editing from the ground up on a few core things uh, that we can then really tackle in September. I think that's really good. Uh, and to the people who spent time submitting the drafts that we have today and that we went through in the shotgun style, I think they've been incredibly valuable from my perspective. Uh, there has been a lot of ideas floated around. Uh, when we started this, you know, this, remember this is only the second time we've met. When we started this meeting, uh, this, this working group, there was a lot of sort of nascent ideas, but nothing had really gelled and come together. Uh, between now and then, we've had a lot of good suggestions and a good proposals and some things that we, some of us don't like, but we've had some uh, meaty suggestions and meaty drafts put together with ideas. And I think that really sets us up nicely, as Ben pointed out, uh, that we can now take these uh, new understandings we all have obtained through these the hard work the drafters have done uh, and the time they've taken to present here and you know put them into what we already understood each of us about the uh, the landscape and the use cases that we need to serve uh, serve and then next step move forward and start meeting those things so i, I i'm I, I you know apologize for the shotgun approach it was a we got overwhelmed with drafts at the beginning or at late but um i'm actually optimistic on the direction we're going that's my take dave back over to you to close out uh bye <laughs> By all. Thank you. And thank you to our note takers, by the way, uh, Ted, yes. uh, Ted Lemon and, and Barbara Stark. Yes. Thank you very, very much for the help. Okay. Bye y'all. See you tomorrow. <laughs>